Hello and welcome to your lecture on the lymphatic and immune systems, which is chapter 21. We are going to go ahead and start off with section one on the anatomy of the lymphatic and immune systems. First, let's talk a little bit about some background. Our immune system is gonna be this complex collection of cells and organs that are working to destroy and neutralize the pathogens that enter our body that could cause disease or death. Whereas our lymphatic system is going to be similar to our circulatory system in that we have these vessels that work together and within them we are going to have some cells and also some organs associated with it that will help to carry some of the excess fluid to our bloodstream, specifically our venous system, and also be able to filter for pathogens from our blood. Now, although we could talk about these two systems distinctly, they're very much intertwined with one another, especially because within our lymphatic system, the cells that reside within some of the organs, such as our lymph nodes or the spleen, will have immune cells within them. And so in that way, we're helping to defend the body from pathogens. Let's talk more deeply about the functions of the lymphatic system. The three main functions will be fluid balance, fat absorption, and defense. So regarding the fluid absorption, we are going to first start off our journey here at our capillaries. So notice how these are our blood capillaries. We start off in our arterial, it goes into the capillary. We usually have exchange with the tissues, right? We give off nutrients and oxygen. We pick up waste products and put it into the venule to be carried back. So as we are exchanging with the tissues surrounding the capillary network here, we move contents into the tissue and 90% of that fluid will then go back onto the venous end in the capillary. 10% of that fluid is gonna move from the interstitial tissue out here into what we call the lymphatic capillaries. So you can kind of do the math here. We've got 30 liters from the capillaries moving into the interstitial tissue, becoming interstitial fluid at that point, and the 27 liters then move back here. So three liters are moving from the interstitial tissue into the lymphatic capillaries. And at that point, we're gonna change the name from interstitial fluid to lymph once it enters these capillaries. Now, what about fat absorption? We will do this through special structures called lacteals. Within our digestive tract, we are going to have, and let me really quickly just kind of draw out a little um, villi here. So in the small intestines, we have these finger-like projections that are projecting into the lumen of the intestine. So the lumen would be where the food comes into contact, right? And so in that area, we are going to have our blood capillaries, and I'm just going to draw this as a little squiggle. And then in the very center of it, we are going to have our lacteal. Now the lacteal is a specialized lymphatic capillary. And so what happens is as the food is moving through in the intestines here in the lumen, we are going to be able to pick up our carbs and our protein and move that into the blood capillaries directly. But when it comes to fat, that is going to move directly into the lacteal. And so now this fat is mixing with the, um, with the lymph that we find within the lacteal. And we have a new name for that, and that is going to be chyle. The last function is defense. And one of the key organs that we have to work within our lymphatic system for this is our lymph node that we see here. So as we said, that fluid moves into the lymphatic capillaries. We're going to go through a vessel, which brings that lymph into the lymph node. And here we can come into contact with microorganisms and other foreign substances where the lymph node is going to filter for them and find like we said, any pathogens and combat them. It kind of sounds the alarm for our immune system. And so we can trigger that immune system and then eventually the rest of that fluid will move through the lymphatic vessels and make its way into our venous system, which then brings it back into the heart. So note that these lymph nodes are small bean-shaped organs 
Um, we find them throughout the body. You're going to see that better in this next slide. So over here, we can kind of see those round spots in here. Those are representing our lymph nodes, and we'll see some clearer pictures as we move through. But first, let's talk about what lymph is. We know that it's moving through our lymphatic system. This fluid is made up of water plus solutes from two sources, from our plasma, which we know came from our capillaries right we were able to move that into our tissues and that plasma contains ions nutrients gases and some proteins and we're also going to have some cells like hormones our leukocytes meaning our white blood cells enzymes and waste products we need to get rid of so as we said they kind of flow through the entire lymphatic system and eventually they're going to come back through two ducts we have one called the thoracic duct that will bring it over to the left side of our veins we'll go into more detail later and then our right lymphatic duct that will bring it into the right side of our veins here and we really need this to happen so we have good fluid balance within our body next let's talk about the organs within our lymphatic system our primary organs are going to be the bone marrow that in our young life we're going to find within our long bones but as we um mature into an adult, we're going to find it in flat bones like our skull, our vertebrae, our sternum, and so forth. And then the other one is going to be our thymus. Now, sometimes students mix up thymus and the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland is here in the neck, whereas our thymus is found kind of overlaying the heart here. And it does start to shrink or atrophy as we age. So if you're an adult, yours is smaller than, let's say, an eight-year-old. Our secondary organs would include the lymph nodes that we just talked about in the previous slide and the lymphatic vessels, our spleen that we find here in the upper left quadrant of the abdomen, our tonsils, which we will talk about in the nasopharynx and the oral cavity, and then we've got malt. And malt, you can't really distinguish in one specific place. It stands for mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. And so we're going to find that throughout the mucosa within our body. Let's revisit those lymphatic capillaries now. These vessels are unique because they are going to start blindly, meaning that we don't have a vessel feeding into these lymphatic capillaries like we do with our blood capillaries, right? With the arterial coming in, uh, venual going out. Instead, what we are going to see and Yes, I know that the blood flow is in the other direction, but I'm just using this as an example. Anyway, um, where, where was I getting at? So these uh, lymphatic capillaries start off blindly. So the way that they're going to allow the fluid to move in is that these cells in here, I don't know if I have a clearer picture coming up, but these cells sit on top of one another, kind of like shingles. So these are still endothelial cells, so that's why they're flat and we only have one layer, but they pile up like this. And so by doing that, we are allowing the fluid to move in through these little mini valve flaps. And once they move in to the lymphatic capillary, they cannot go back out in that the other direction because of that valve ensuring we have this one way flow. So that would be the one side of the capillary. I'm just going to quickly finish this out. So not the best drawing here, but <laughs> you can imagine how this flow would go in this direction from now on and then move into the next part. So we um, have a little pathway written out here for you. So here's the blood capillary. And from there, we moved into that inter, uh, we move it and turn it into interstitial fluid within the interstitial tissue. That fluid then goes into the lymphatic capillaries. And now we call that fluid lymph. From there, we're going to go through an afferent lymphatic vessel. Afferent always means direction is going in. So we're moving into the lymph node here, and then we will move out through an efferent lymphatic vessel. Efferent always means outgoing. And then we've got our lymphatic trunk, which then drains into a lymphatic duct, and it's the lymphatic duct that then drains it into a vein, which will take it back to the heart, specifically at the right atrium.
So at the beginning of this section, I talked about how our lymphatic vessels are similar to our veins. And that is because these lymphatic vessels have these valves that help to ensure one-way flow, as we saw with the mini valves in our capillaries. And the other thing is that they are going to allow the lymph to move through by relying on the skeletal muscles that surround the lymphatic vessel. By contracting that skeletal muscle, we put pressure on the vessel and that pushes the fluid up, moving toward the heart. And if it tries moving backward, the valves prevent it. And the other thing is these vessels lie close to our arteries. And so just the pulse of that artery being near the lymphatic vessel will also help to move that lymph in one direction. Also, as we move into our uh, thorax, we can have our respiratory pump help us move the lymph in that direction as well, just by breathing. So now let's move through the different components again of our lymphatic system. So we said in our blood capillary, we move that fluid out into the interstitial tissue. 90% of that fluid is then gonna move back into the blood capillary, whereas 10% stays in the interstitial tissue and gets picked up by the lymphatic capillary. Now this is a better depiction of what those valves look like. Here, notice too that the lymphatic capillary, even though I've kind of depicted this as being far away from one another, but those capillaries really are surrounding the blood capillary. And so what we'll see is that fluid is moving in through those mini valve flaps into the lymphatic capillary, and then we'll move in one direction toward our next structure, which will be our afferent lymphatic vessel. So here's another great picture depicting that mini valve flap. So some things to note as far as differences between the blood capillaries and lymphatic capillaries is that our lymphatic capillaries are more permeable than our blood capillaries. And this helps to ensure that some of that fluid is going to be able to move in the lymphatic capillaries rather than into the blood capillaries. Our Epithelium has those one-way mini valves, and we're going to find them in all parts of our body except for our nervous system, such as the central nervous system, our bone marrow, and tissues that don't have blood vessels, such as our cartilage, our cornea, the epidermis, um, anything that is really avascular. Now let's revisit those lacteals again. Remember we find those specifically within the intestines. And so here's a histologic view of the small intestines. This would be the lumen here where the food is coming into contact with the villi. And so inside this villi here is where that lacteal is. Again, it is a specialized lymphatic capillary in which we will absorb our digested fat and mix it with the lymph that we have there, and we call it chyle. And here's another depiction of this. That yellow vessel there is our lacteal. That's gonna pick up the fatty acids. And another histology image. This is of a villus here in the jejunum, part of the small intestines. And notice how over here is our capillary where we're gonna have all of our, um, our red blood cells, let's say, whereas at the green arrow here, it is white. And that is because we are not able to stain fat. And so we know that this is our lacteal containing the chyle or fatty lymph. So starting from our lymphatic capillaries again, those will drain the lymph into our afferent lymphatic vessels, which have valves to make sure they're going in one direction. That then is gonna drain into our lymph nodes, which we will find along the vessels, and we filter the lymph there to search for pathogens. We will then go into an efferent lymphatic vessel that will take it into the lymphatic trunks. And that's what's being depicted over here. I know this is a bit tiny, um, but we are going to have specific trunks like 
the jugular trunks that's going to drain the head and the neck. We have subclavian trunks that's draining the upper limb, a bronchomediastinal trunk that will drain the thorax. And then down here, we would have a intestinal trunk and two lumbar trunks that helps to drain the abdomen and the, our two lower limbs. So all of these trunks are then going to drain their lymph into lymphatic ducts. And as I said before, we really only have two lymphatic ducts. One of them is the right lymphatic duct, and that right lymphatic duct is going to drain right over here at the junction of the internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein on the right side of the body. So note that that right lymphatic duct will only drain the right side of the body above the diaphragm. So that includes our right upper limb, our right chest, our right neck, our right head. And everything else that you see out here is drained by the thoracic duct. So three-fourths of the body is drained by the thoracic duct, and that's mainly because we have that intestinal trunk and the two lumbar trunks that will drain into this sac here known as the um, cyst cisterna chile, had to think about that for a minute, cisterna chile, which then drains into the thoracic duct. And that thoracic duct then moves up and will drain at the junction of the internal jugular vein on the left side and our left subclavian vein. Now, once that lymph makes it into those veins, we know that the, the internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein on both sides will then drain into its respective brachiocephalic vein. The right and left brachiocephalic veins then drain into the superior vena cava and into the right atrium of the heart. All right, let's revisit those lymphatic vessels again and note that at the very bottom here, I kind of have that pathway outlined and highlight the areas that we're talking about. So when we look at the lymph node, note that we have about four or five afferent lymphatic vessels bringing all of this lymph into the lymph node here. So we have a really easy time bringing all of this lymph in, but now that it's in the lymph node, we want to slow this down so that our lymph node can filter the lymph and look for pathogens. So the exit route only is gonna consist of one to two efferent lymphatic vessels. So I always kind of give um, an analogy here, if we were to, within our classroom, have five doors open and I yell out to the university, hey everyone, free pizza in room, let's say 416. And then all of a sudden, all of these students pile into the classroom through all of those doors. They can move in really quickly. But then I shut all those doors, we have the students eat the pizza, and then they're pretty much done, right? They finish eating, and majority of them are gonna finish eating around the same time. But because I'm only going to open one or two doors, it's gonna take more time to allow all the students out of the classroom. So that is the lymph node's way of slowing that lymph down by having uh, lots of entrance doors, but only a few exit doors. And here's a clear view now of all of those different trunks. I've talked about them pretty extensively, so I'll leave this figure just as a review. There are our lumbar trunks, our bronchomediastinal trunks, our subclavian trunks, our jugular trunks, our intestinal trunk, and that, again, um, the intestinal trunk with the two lumbar trunks are going to drain into the cisterna chile, which will then drain into the thoracic duct and takes it back to the venous system. Just because I am a visual learner, I know that lots of different views and images are really helpful. So over here, we can see these lymphatic uh, trunks all draining into the right lymphatic duct here. And then here on the left side, we have all of the left lymphatic uh, trunks, excuse me, draining into our thoracic duct. So as I mentioned before, we have our right lymphatic duct draining the right side of our 
upper arm or I should say our upper limb, our head and our neck, as well as the thorax, whereas the thoracic duct is draining the rest of the body, meaning the left side of the head and neck, left thorax, left upper limb, our abdomen, and our two lower extremities. Something else to note on this image is that our areas where we have the most prominent lymph nodes will be in our cervical region, which is in our neck, our axillary region in the armpit, as well as the inguinal lymph node here in the groin. And here's a larger image I put in here so that you can see the right lymphatic duct moving into our venous system and our thoracic duct moving into our left venous system. Now let's talk about the organization of immune function. Now the functioning within our immune system is based on our ability to resist damage of foreign substances such as microorganisms and harmful chemicals that can cause disease within our body. And so we can divide our immune system into two distinct categories. We've got our innate or non-specific resistance or immunity and our adaptive or specific immunity. So when we talk about our innate immune system, we are talking about our physical and chemical barriers. How are we trying to prevent that pathogen from even entering our body? We might prevent it through our skin, but sometimes we've got um, our tears that can wash away those pathogens, our saliva, our mucous membranes or mucus itself that can trap the pathogens. And we consider this to be our acidic mantle, especially on our skin. We're going to secrete things such as sebum that create that acidic environment on our skin. We also have some chemical mediators that can promote things like phagocytosis or cell eating and inflammation. And we've got for cells within the system are the cells that are involved in phagocytosis and the ones that are able to produce chemicals to induce things such as phagocytosis and inflammation. With adaptive immunity, it is specific. So it does take longer to tailor make a approach to a pathogen. Um, so it can be really specific to the type of antigen or pathogen that we're fighting. So our cells that we use for this are lymphocytes, also known as our B and T cells, and we will create an immunological memory. That means that we're able to remember the pathogen that has entered our body before, how we combated it, so that the next time that same pathogen enters our body, we're able to respond to it very quickly. You may have also heard our our immune system referred to as our first, second, or third line of defense. So let's clarify here that our innate immune system would consist of our first and second line defenses, whereas our adaptive is known as our third line of defense. And we're going to further subdivide the adaptive immune system into humoral immunity and cellular immunity. So we'll talk more about that in just a couple slides. So regarding our lymphocytes, which we said we will have functioning in our adaptive immune system, we will have our B cells, T cells, plasma cells, and natural killer cells. And so we'll have lots of these different clones existing because of genetic recombination during development of these lymphocytes. So we'll start off with our B and T cells. We mentioned earlier in this lecture that they are going to start off in our red bone marrow. And so this is where they are born, where they originate. And then our B cells are going to stay here in the bone marrow in order to mature. So B for bone, B for B cells. And then our Thym um, excuse me, our T cells are going to travel over to our thymus to mature. So that's why we call these T cells, T for thymus, T for our T cells. And so after these cells mature, they can also move through our circulatory system and make their way over to secondary um, lymphoid organs such as the lymph node or the spleen and also our other lymphatic tissues. So you could see here that we're talking about 
our lymphocytes interacting with each other and something called antigen presenting cells. So our antigen presenting cells, I put kind of a picture here as far as what their functions are. They are searching throughout the body to look for anything that looks foreign. So here's our antigen presenting cell. It runs into a foreign microbe. And on this microbe, we've got lots of antigens. Remember that antigens are like an ID for cells. It tells us what type of cell it is, if it's foreign, if it's our own body cell. Think of like our red blood cells, how we had an A antigen, and that represented, represented having type A blood, right? So we see this foreign invader. The antigen-presenting cell is going to take up that um, microbe and basically use enzymes to break it down and then place the antigen, a piece of that pathogen that is an ID, on this receptor. And this receptor we call MHC proteins or MHC molecules, and it presents it to other immune cells. And so that can help trigger or produce an immune response. Areas where um, we will have this happen can take place in our diffuse lymphatic tissue, our lymphatic nodules, the tonsils, our lymph nodes, or the spleen. And then this is just a picture of what a lymphocyte looks like. Notice how the nucleus is so large, it takes up the majority of the cell that we only have this light purple cytoplasm showing. Now let's specifically talk about our B cells. These are cells that are going to play the big role in producing antibodies. Remember that antibodies are going to be a group of proteins that bind specifically to pathogen-associated molecules known as antigens. And so you can see an example of that taking place over here. So we aren't able to have this B cell bind to this antigen it is not the right attachment to it. So if you look very carefully here, you can see kind of that U shape at the end. It's not a match for it. So then another B cell has a receptor that is more of a match to this antigen. So it is going to now attach and the B cell becomes activated by binding to that antigen. And our B cell can then differentiate into what we call plasma cells. Now these plasma cells are active and can produce this specific tailored antibody to the pathogen that has that antigen on it. And so we can see here of course, this is a different illustration, but the antibody is attaching to the antigens and in this case is causing them to uh, agglutinate or form a complex so that we can better mark them for destruction. Now, what about our T cells? Our T cells have a variety of functions and are going to have more of a direct response to pathogens and be able to secrete soluble factors. So the different types that we have are our helper T cells, which are also known as CD4 cells because they've got this CD4 receptor here. Our killer or cytotoxic T cells, these are also known as CD8 cells. And then we've got our T regulatory cells. These will, yes, have a CD4 um, receptor here, but we also have CD25, and they are going to be responsible for really stopping the immune attack so that, um, so that we don't continue to uh, destroy our body after we've gotten rid of a pathogen. So some uh, theories state that the regulatory T cells have a problem stopping, and that's how we form autoimmune diseases. And then we've got our memory T cells, which, as we said before, will help form an immunological memory to specific pathogens. So if we become infected with that same pathogen, pathogen again, we will be able to form a rapid response. Shifting gears back to our B cells, we said our active B cells differentiate and create our plasma cells. So this is what a plasma cell really looks like. And you could see that we've got uh, regular 
organelles here, right? A nucleus, mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, and they are working to produce antibodies. And we've got a large cytoplasm here with a really large rough ER. And if you remember some information from learning about cells, you know that rough ER is plays a vital role in protein synthesis, along with our Golgi apparatus, right? And this is what they look like within a um, blood smear. So you could see that nucleus on one side and the large cytoplasm here for protein synthesis. Now the last type of lymphocyte we're gonna talk about are natural killer cells, or known as NK cells. And these play a role within our innate immune response, whereas B cells, T cells, plasma cells, they work within our adaptive response. So natural killer cells, this is a nonspecific attack. They're gonna circulate in our blood and are able to contain these cytotoxic cell killing granules in its cytoplasm so that when we recognize that we have a pathogen or an abnormal cell such as a cancer cell or tumor cell we are able to release those granules and cause the bad cell to go through lysis essentially killing them and it shares the same mechanism as those killer T cells because they will too have these granules that they are able to secrete. So NK cells, just so we're clear, are going to be able to do this mechanism to more of our cancer cells and our cells that have been infected with viruses. And here is a little table that talks about the things that we mentioned in the previous slide, just as a summary. Next, let's revisit those primary lymphoid organs again, the bone marrow and our thymus. We said these are the areas where our lymphocytes are going to mature. B cells will mature in the bone marrow, T cells will mature in the thymus, and then they will proliferate and can attack pathogens without harming our own body cells. With our bone marrow, we know that we're gonna have a loose collection of cells where hematopoiesis takes place. So notice in this image here how we've got our red bone marrow here, that's where hematopoiesis is taking place. And in the center here, we have our yellow bone marrow. This is going to basically contain fat where we can store energy and have lots of adipocytes stored. We will have our long bones in our adult bodies have that red bone marrow turn into yellow bone marrow as we age. And we already said this is where our B and T cells are gonna originate. B cells mature here, but our T cells, also known as thymocytes, will leave the bone marrow to mature in the thymus instead. So speaking of the thymus, Again, we find that kind of overlaying the heart here. It is bilobed, and we will see in this closer view of the thymus that connective tissue holds lobes close together here. So this is a lobe here, a lobe here, and it's going to separate them and form a capsule. That capsule is on this outer edge over here. The lobules that I pointed out are also going to be called trabeculae. And so as we kind of zoom out of this, we can see at the outer edge, we are going to have a cortex. This is where our thymocytes, epithelial cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells could be found. And then on the inner aspect, we are going to find our medulla. And this we will see containing our thymocytes that are going to soon leave the thymus. Now, as we said in the previous slide, our T cells can get ready to leave the thymus. And what they could do along with our B cells is enter into a secondary lymphoid organ. So at this point, our lymphocytes 
are going to be called naive lymphocytes as they enter a secondary lymphoid organ, meaning they left their primary organ, either the bone marrow or the thymus, and entered this secondary organ. But they haven't encountered an antigen yet, meaning they are not active yet. So our organs that are secondary could be our lymph nodes, our spleen, or lymphoid nodules, which you could see a lymphoid nodule over here. It too kind of has that look where we have a cortex and a medulla, but we don't really call it a medulla. It's really a germinal center. So what we see amongst these secondary organs is that they will have presence of lymphoid follicles. Like we said, we've got one over here and our internal structure will consist of reticular fibers and fixed macrophages. We will see germinal centers in which we will have a lot of dividing taking place and differentiating of our B cells, and we have high endothelial venules, and we'll have thicker cellular linings that are going to be more columnar. So let's start looking at each of these secondary lymphoid organs. First up is our lymph nodes. Its function is to filter the lymph, as we said before, and our substances in here are removed by phagocytosis through our macrophages and dendritic cells, or it helps to stimulate our B and T cells so that we can proliferate them within the germinal centers which are the lighter colors here within our lymphoid follicles. Now we'll often see that our cancer cells may migrate to the lymph nodes and become trapped there and can proliferate. Then they can move from the lymphatic system to our circulatory system and spread cancer throughout the body, which we in that instance would say that the cancer has metastasized. It has moved from the primary site to a further location. Another secondary lymphoid organ is the spleen, and we are gonna find that in the upper left quadrant of the abdomen. And this organ is gonna to help to filter the blood because of its extensive vascularization that it has. And we've got lots of macrophages in here and dendritic cells that will help to remove any microbes that we find or dying red blood cells. And remember, our red blood cells only last about 120 days anyway. So when we look at a histology view of our spleen, we could see we have our areas of red pulp with lots of veins and white pulp, which are associated with our arteries. Now our periarterial lymphatic sheath and lymphatic nodules are located in the white pulp here, and they're going to have the lymphocytes in there as well as the macrophages that we find within the red pulp here. And then lastly, we've got, I shouldn't say lastly, we have some more coming up, but another secondary lymphoid organ are our lymphoid nodules. This means that we've got a dense cluster of lymphocytes. There is not a capsule that kind of encases them in. So we tend to find these in our respiratory and digestive tracts. So that would consist of BALT, our bronchial associated lymphoid tissue and malt mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. And then we'll talk about our tonsils next. Our tonsils are going to be these large groups of lymphatic nodules within the nasopharynx and oral cavity. So clearly here we're looking in the oral cavity, but going above the hard palate, which has been removed here, and the soft palate, we can see the pharyngeal tonsil that would be found in the nasopharynx. These tonsils help to protect us against bacteria and other harmful materials. It really forms this ring around the oral cavity and the pharynx to try and combat anything from moving further down into our GI or respiratory tracts. So let's learn about the different names that we have for these tonsils. First, we have our palatine tonsil, which are really known as our tonsils. Whenever somebody mentions that, they're typically referring to these. And we find that at the posterior end of our oral cavity on the lateral walls. At the base of the tongue, we would have our lingual tonsil. And then lastly, 
We're going to switch views here. This is a sagittal cut through the face where we can see into the nasopharynx where we have our pharyngeal tonsil, also known as our adenoids. And lastly, and this is less known, but we've got our tubal tonsil. That also is in our nasopharynx, and it surrounds the auditory tube. So this hole right here is our auditory tube that connects our nasopharynx to the middle ear. So when we look at our histology view of a tonsil, we see that it too contains lymphatic nodules that will have within it a germinal center. So this tonsil is not fully encapsulated and we've got epithelial tissue overlying our tonsil that is going to form invaginations. And those are called tonsillar crypts. And I kind of wish I had a image of that here. These crypts, which you can see kind of enlarged over here, are going to trap and destroy bacteria and particulate matter. Here's the picture I'm looking for. So another histology view, and here you could see that groove in here. That is our tonsillar crypt. Now let's talk about our associated lymphatic tissues. Malt is going to have our lymphatic or uh, lymphoid follicles directly associated with our mucous membranes. It's going to make up dome-shaped structures found underlying the mucosa in our GI tract, the breast tissue, lungs, and our eyes. Now here is an image of malt within our ileum, and here you could see that we have this specialized area known as Peyer's patches. And this is going to be really important for our immune response against ingested substances that's moving through our GI tract. Then we've got BALT or bronchus associated lymphoid tissue. And of course, this is where we find our lymphoid follicles along the bronchi. And that's going to help us protect our body against inhaled pathogens.